Welcome to Chew On This. You are about to enter a discussion on how to actually live out faith in Christ in the reality of our messy lives. This discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, the pastoral preaching notes, and the live large group discussion these notes prompted. Something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come on, chew on this with us. If I asked you to define the word prayer, what would you say? What would you think if I told you that prayer is a tool, that prayer is a key, that prayer is a weapon, that prayer is a bridge? This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine, along with Pastor Robin Bjornsson, and we want to thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Chew on This. This topic was discussed with a little bit of prodding. I promised everyone they need espresso next Wednesday night, <laughs> on Wednesday night, November 3rd. We are still on the topic of still standing, and this was week eight, the example of Nehemiah. I want to remind you that all of the preaching notes are available on our website, wheelchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night. And there are some wonderful charts in there that help organize depending on what type of brain processes you use to study. Some really nice charts that help us organize the topic that we are talking about today. So when we began last night, I wanted to go back to the beginning because there is a portion of scripture where this this concept of still standing, it just got stuck in my being during my personal devotion time, and I just needed more definition. I, I, I needed it to be a poster in my head. I needed to have all of the descriptions and the understanding. I needed my brain to be mapped out on a piece of paper, so I started writing in my devotional journal and making little clouds and putting different thoughts in it, because it's a pattern. It's got to come out of my head. And after reading Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, I, I, need, I need a different image in my brain so I can apply it easier, because I love the image Paul, Paul speaks there and pens there, but as in my personality and my understanding, I need to make the connection with, and so we haven't even, Pastor Robin, in this series, we haven't even sat down and done this yet. It's going to be coming up in the last two weeks here, this idea of what is the quote-unquote armor of God. I needed a different image, and I needed more, more of a visceral reaction to it. I needed to see people in Scripture who have done this, because Paul didn't make this stuff up. Paul is referring to things he's already seen and known. And you talk about a well-studied man who knows his history and knows his present and, and can chew it up and bake it in his heart and regurgitate it out in something applicable. So I wanted to have a similar reaction of putting and ingesting scripture and understanding and practice, because I love Jesus since I've been 14 years old, and I'm just a tad bit older now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was reading Ephesians 6, and the phrase here at the end of verse 13, when it says, and having done all to stand firm, and looking in a different version, it says, and having prepared everything, take your stand. All right, I get the understand word prepare because it's talking about being a prepared person, this whole portion of scripture. And yes, I will read it in just a moment. But letting that bake and bubble, and as that starts to happen to one person, I know you have the same experience, you start seeing and reading and attaching things to the process. This is how series get born in my head and in my being. So I wanted to last night when we were talking about the example of Nehemiah, I wanted to reconnect with this because in my study time, when I was baking on this Ephesians 6 portion of scripture, and I happened to reading, be reading about Hezekiah and Nehemiah and looking at the structure there in the Old Testament, there was this connection with this scripture. And that's what we want to do on this podcast today is connecting Nehemiah's life to what Paul was talking about and seeing, is it seamless? Is it related? Is it just associated? Well, we're going to find out today on the podcast, but let's begin by reading Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And I encourage you in your own private time to either go on a Bible app so you can look up all the different versions, but read this portion of scripture in different versions so your brain can start associating with it in the ways that are in your head already, and you can add this to it. So Paul is panning to the Ephesians, and just by way 
of an announcement. We will be studying the book of Ephesians starting January, so upcoming podcast is going to be on the amazing grace that Ephesians speaks about and how we can live that in our life here in the new year. But that is coming in the future. Right now we're looking at Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. Paul pens this. Finally, finally, he's closing out the letter. These are his his closing words to the church. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. To do this, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. All right? (laughs) Great definition. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, comma, to stand firm. Then he goes on, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To the end, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So in verses 18, in verse 18, he talks about praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayers and supplication. Pray, 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 pray. and when you're done, pray some more. Keep alert by being by by preserve it by um, perseverance by preserve it sounds too much like jelly <laughs> preserves preserves yes and it's talking about but by perseverance not preserving but by persevering persevering there you go thank you I think uh, this lady needs a little bit more tea but by making all supplications for the saints so in here as Paul is wrapping up this portion of thought he ends with an, and pray and pray pray and persevere and pray, persevering, not preserving, but it does help us be preserved. (laughs) So when we look at that, my brain just started popcorning and thinking, this is, we don't know a lot about Nehemiah's life prior to this portion in scripture that is listed in the book in the Old Testament. Because we have the chronicle, we have chronicles one and two, and then there's Ezra, and then there's Nehemiah, and they're all dealing with the same time around the Book of Esther, and so that they're contemporaries of one another, all within close enough spitting distance. So this is when Persia was large and in charge of the world at the time. But before we get to that piece of watching Nehemiah do Ephesians six, and I do have to wonder how much Paul knew of all, I mean, he was so well studied, he had to know this, and he was a brilliant individual. So wondering everything that was going through his brain as he is penning this, realizing how important this is, these are those closing final words of his encouragement to a very strong church that ended up being the hub of Christianity over in Asia when he was martyred. So the church in Ephesus was the central, wonderful, amazing congregation community of believers. It is where John the Apostle and Jesus' mother Mary, who he was taking care of, that's where they moved and lived and ended up, I believe Mary is buried there, and that is where John eventually died somewhere way into his hundreds. So here looking at Nehemiah and does he live this? Does Nehemiah know this? Because the truths of, truths of God are in his character. They're not something that he espouses for a generation. They're just him. And we get to figure that out the more we get into his will, more that we study his word to understand his character. We get to meet all these amazing things that are in this character that embodies all truth. And so we know that Nehemiah has to touch in this because Nehemiah loves God. But to understand Nehemiah and what he was dealing with, we're going to jump into this great big puke of a problem and watch Nehemiah deal with it. So we get to watch Nehemiah do messy life. 
We get to watch him. Nehemiah do messy life. But in order to understand the mess he's shoveling through, we need to understand a little bit of his history. In order to do that, I thought it would be a really good primer to just look at some of the kings of Judah to give it an idea of what Nehemiah was up against and a mindset and the culture and why in the world there was this mess in the first place, which was fun watching people nod their heads, trying to go through this quick enough so they get the taste of the culture, but then they don't get stuck there because that wasn't the focus of the, the, the conversation of the, the sermon on Wednesday night of the interactive sermon, <laughs> that community-based learning experience. So here we're going to be looking, we're going to start with King Hezekiah, looking at King Hezekiah, and then we're going to go into to the very Zedekiah, the very last king that Judah had. So here we have King Hezekiah. He is a very great king. He reigned for 29 years. In there, him and God had some, he had some real life experience. He did some things that weren't exactly the greatest, and he ended up he was he ended up living fifteen years longer than he was supposed to because he asked God to extend his life and God did graciously had loves Hezekiah, had compassion and touched him and healed him and he lived fifteen years longer. And there's more space devoted to Hezekiah in Holy Scripture than to almost any other king since the time of Solomon. Now David fills up a lot. Saul and David in the beginning of the, the kingdom process for the nation of Israel. But after Solomon, Hezekiah has the most paper space, word space. And there's a reason for that. He was a very great king. And he created a structure for the nation of Judah. Israel was a different in a different territory by now. So he did this. And in that last 15 years of his life, he fathered a son named Manasseh. Now, the very next king after Hezekiah was his son, Manasseh, who lived, watched his, his father love the people, love Yahweh, love, and he, Manasseh is there. He's not living in a closet. He hears and he sees and he participates. It's important for the king's sons to watch and to be. So Manasseh ended up being the next king, and he turned out to be, Scripture says, and this just blows my mind, that he is the absolute wickedest king in Judah's history, the wickedest evil, more vile than the nations that God removed out of this territory because of their sin and their evil. He had them removed and planted Israel here because that evil had to leave the face of the earth or mankind, in my opinion, this is Pastor O's opinion, mankind would not go to where it needed to go in order for the Messiah to be born. So these people are removed. God gives this portion of land to Israel. But Manasseh is this evil, wicked king and he reigns the longest. He reigns for 55 years. So we know he has to be young when he starts. And he was the worst who ever, I mean, he was worse than anybody who lived in this area of the land ever. And he brought back Baal worship, where you sacrifice your children. Well, that's more like the sacrifice, but you can also do it in Baal worship. But it says that he had his, his sons walk through the fire. So he had this uh, offering his children to these evil entities to this satanic ritual, this occultic belief. He also brought back the perversion of the Asherah worship, which was all very sexually oriented. He actually had an, some kind of carved sexual image made of that type of belief and had it put in the temple where you were supposed to worship God. He defiled it on purpose. The wickedness gave him glee, in my understanding, as people, as human nature gets worse and worse and more deprived and more depraved and does doing all this stuff, it, you just grow, you just want to be more vile. It you don't stay stagnant no matter which way you go. This is where addiction happens. And in my thinking process, they became addicted to the thrill of this and the evil and watching people being tortured. I mean, they were feeding off of what this did. Humanity and human life meant nothing. Uh, what meant something was power and control. And the respect for human life, nothing. I mean, if you can offer your children like that, there's a thing that's wrong. But he also added worship of the stars. He added this into their their belief system. So we know that Manasseh also had access to other areas and other types of worship. And so what we call astrology, they started there in that area. And God is like, you, you can't. And so he built altars for the worship of stars in the heavens and that you can chart your own path and you are God and all you need to do is interpret what's going on around you. He sought out and he used, he used witchcraft to help control and to do things. He consulted spiritists and, and mediums and did what they said. Those were his guides in life. And history, re, history states, extra biblical sources state that Manasseh is the one who 
made the decision to have Isaiah martyred, and he had him sawn in half, and that is talked about in Hebrews eleven thirty seven. So because of this and going on for so long and people would not listen to the prophets telling them you must repent, this is going to, you're going to annihilate yourself as, as a civilization. Civilization can't feed each other this way and expect to last. You don't. So the Lord said he would punish the people as he had Samaria the greater Israel. And he said, Jerusalem will be empty when the punishment is done. There is a consequence. It isn't like God said, you're naughty and here is your discipline. No, there's something in the supernatural. When you do this evil, it feeds the tipping point of where it actually is going to tip. We have a a huge part into what consequences look like. It's not like God has a rule book and, oh, naughty baby, naughty baby does this. Well, naughty child gets this, naughty adult gets this. It doesn't work that way. There are spiritual laws that govern. I don't understand it, but in your brain, as you're looking at what Scripture talks about, saying this is going to happen. It's not because God went down the naughty list and decided, oh, no. It's like this is what happens when you feed this much evil. Society tips, and this is what's going to happen to you. It, 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 the people are going to be gone. This territory of land is going to be emptied. I'm going to quit protecting you from evil because you are feeding evil and evil grows and then evil feeds other evil. And when evil reach, reaches this maximum explosion, this is what's going to happen. And his people are going to be led away. The, the people of Judah are going to be led away into captivity by a nation that is stronger than them, that is more evil, because the Lord's protection is going to be removed. We see this whole principle in Noah. Yes. I mean, we see this whole principle working out in a different society in a different time, but it looks to me like the same principle of yes. what happened with Noah and the culture that yes. he lived in and how heinous it became and yes. the drastic measures that the Lord had to go through to deal with it in, in his time. Yes. And we look at... God orchestrating history so the Messiah can come. So that plays into this stuff here too in the Old Testament. It's interesting that Manasseh was taken into captivity by the king of Assyria and brought to Babylon. Eventually, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be the next one, and we're going to progress through all the different people that um, came into Judah, took them, exiled them, controlled them, was their king. But it's interesting, while Manasseh was in that prison, he repented. He remembered everything the prophets had told him. He repented and returned to the Lord. And the Lord did a crazy thing, allowed Manasseh, however that works, that the nation that was in charge brought him back and he was able to be king once again. But do you think anyone listened to him? They were so addicted to what he had created and had done for so long. Nobody listened to him. So even though he had repented, the nation was not going to. It was too late for the people of Judah. Four different nations came and conquered Judah and created uh, exiles and pillaged their stuff and armies taking control of, their, of them and kingdoms taking all their wealth. So Manasseh's son Ammon was the next, or Ammon was the next king, and he was a king for only two years. And his servants conspired and killed him. So I'm not sure which is evil and evil and evil, but the assassins were then executed by the people, and his son Josiah was made king. So, so people were done, and they didn't want Ammon, and they put Josiah as king. Josiah was eight years old when he was set on the throne, and he was a very good and righteous king. They say that his thoroughness of his reforms, what Manasseh did, Josiah completely undone. He undid it. He, he just took all of these horrible things, taking them out, burning, getting rid of all of this evil, everything that people did with intent to do evil and to harm others. He cleansed the land. He repaired the temple in the 18th year of his reign when he was 26 because he started at 8, had the chief priest in that structure to help him reign. And then they found the book of the law. The priest Hilkiah found the book of the law hidden in the temple because if they didn't hide it away, I'm sure Manasseh and those would have burnt it. That is a practice of of power, getting rid of your your written history, and they found it. And at this point, Josiah realized who they were supposed to be. This, this is who we are. We are God's chosen people. What in the world are we doing all of this for? So, <laughs> reading all of this and and inspiring the people and the leaders and the chief priests and the other believers that were hiding because of the evil in their society that we can do this. And slowly but surely they seen Josiah meant business and he was organized enough and had the support of his armies and the people. And so slowly but surely the 
worship of God became part of their norm. And they actually, he actually reinst- reinstituted the Passover, and it turned out to be such a delightful pleasure. They did it extra long, <laughs> and to incorporate people who were not cleansed and ready to participate. And this is where Zephaniah and Jeremiah began their prof- prophetic ministry, is here in Josiah's reign. So he was the last righteous king of Judah. So Nehemiah had to know about this as well. Well, then his son, Josiah's son, Jehoaz, or Jehoaz, became king, and he lasted for three months. And he, for three months, opened back the door, threw out everything his father, and here Egypt decided, and God opened the door, removed his hand, and here we see. Now, it's interesting to note, Josiah knew what punishment was coming, and they consulted uh, Jeremiah's aunt, I believe, um, Hul- what's her name? Huldah. And she said that, yes, this is going to happen, but it will not happen during your lifetime because of how you are ruling. So here, after he's done it, Jehoahaz decided not to follow that. Egypt came within three months and captured and put Judah under their tribute. So they had to pay tribute to Egypt. And they brought Jehoahaz to Egypt where he died. Well, then when he wasn't there, they put uh, Josiah's other son, Jehoiakim, in as king, and he lasted for 11 years. During this time... um, Babylon defeated Egypt, took over and controlled that. So now we have Nebuchadnezzar, or who is the precursor to Nebuchadnezzar. They are now in charge of this territory. Um, They had uh, Uriah the prophet killed. They burned the word of God that Jeremiah had written. So they wanted to get rid of all of that, because if you don't have a written history, do you have a history? Um, They tried to arrest Jeremiah and his scribe, but the Lord hid them away. And then in the third year of Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged all of Jerusalem. This is round one of coming, took some of the inhabitants. This is when Daniel went to Babylon, took items from the temple, um, bound this King Jehoiakim and brought him to Babylon as well. So here, bad king, bad king, all this stuff's going on. And then Jehoiachin, the son of Jehoiakim, was king for three months again. We have somebody here for three months instead of three weeks. And he was a really wicked king to the point where Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged Jerusalem some more, round two of what Nebuchadnezzar could do, and he carried away a second group of exiles, of captives. Um, Ezekiel, the prophet, was taken during this time, and he became, and he stayed there in Babylon and was prophesying there. The royal family was taken, all the soldiers were taken, all the craftsmen were taken, and only the poorest people were left. So this is the territory that Nehemiah is going to be dealing with. So, and Jehoiachin was in, or Jehoiakin was in captivity for 37 years in Babylon when the king at that time freed him from prison and treated him better than any other, the uh, the captive kings, and gave him a position of honor in the court. So we're beginning to see the Spirit of God move in Babylon and create favor for the understanding of who the nation of Israel is, or the nation of Judah. And he provided a lot of riches, even though he was still imprisoned. And this is when the prophet Ezekiel began his ministry. So then, while Jehoiakim or Jehoiachin is here in Babylon, they put another one of Josiah's sons. Jehoiakim was the son, well, so was a grandson of Josiah. So here, now Josiah, this is another one of his sons. These are all his kids, and they just can't seem to get it and to understand all this is going on. But that our human nature and our lack of ability to understand, (laughs) this is only going to get you into trouble. So here, Babylon has Zedekiah in charge, but somewhere in Zedekiah's mind, he's one of Josiah's sons, and he decides, well... I think, I think maybe we don't need to pay tribute to Nebuchadnezzar anymore or Babylon. So he goes and talks to the nation of Egypt, and well, guess who finds out? And he decides, well, you're done. <laughs> you're done, Zedekiah. So Nebuchadnezzar, for 18 months, they fight and a severe famine, of course, in Judah. And Jeremiah kept telling Zedekiah, you're fighting against God it's silly. If you and your, and your family go and bow down to the king and you tell him that you're going to be his vassal and you're going to do, he will spare you. God will have Nebuchadnezzar spare you. He doesn't want to kill you. He just wants you to pay tribute. He wants to own you and you're not strong enough and God has willed this. This is the result of tipping the scale in the supernatural and I can't 
fix it for you. It has been going on for so long, but what God is saying is he will watch over you. Well, Zedekiah wasn't having any of it, and I don't know if it was human ego or whatever, but he ended up trying to do this with Egypt. He ended up trying to escape, and so Nebuchadnezzar took him and sat him in a place, took all his kids, killed his kids all in front of him, and then gouged out his eyes and turned him into a blind man. And this is called the fall of Jerusalem. Babylon destroyed the temple that had stood for 400 years that Solomon built. They destroyed all the gates. They destroyed all the walls. Everything was left in a state of rubble that was worth anything. There was nothing of value you left in this territory and only the poor were left there to take care of the flocks and to leave a marker of the area and be watch over it for the king of Babylon so that was our very quick primer of the destitution of the territory of Judah and the people so this has been known this is going on so here comes this guy named Nehemiah and He, they believe, is born in captivity. He is born in Babylon. And somehow, because the king of Babylon, whoever is the king, they have a process of finding the brightest, the smartest, and plugging them in and training them and teaching them and, and immersing them into their culture so they be, become a prominent part of their culture and want to stay and want to see this grow because they've been given all this education and this opportunity and doing all of this type of stuff. And so he served the king. He was a contemporary of Esther and Daniel. Um, he was a very trusted person in the king's structure, and he wasn't a prophet. Nehemiah wasn't a prophet. He was not a priest either. He didn't come from the priestly line. He was not a king. He wasn't part of the king. He wasn't Josiah, and he was nothing like that. He was a dedicated layman, a dedicated blue-collar worker or white-collar worker, whatever you want to call it. He was just an individual who was really talented and learned and grew and was put in an unbelievably risky position <laughs> and a position of prominence and a position where he had to trust God. So that is his history. And we're going to talk a little bit about more about who he is as we read through these scripture verses and getting an idea. All right, so the armor of God and Paul telling us to prepare everything and to stand. Here we're going to be jumping into Nehemiah's life while he is in the middle of his, his career and being a very successful man in the career, if you can call it back then. I know he's a slave and just trying to put it in an understanding where we can relate to it. We can't relate to that concept very readily, especially here in Minnesota and our life here in 2021. But we understand the history and the hardness of that word. But how he was successful in this, the opportunities that he was given. So looking at who he is. Somewhere... Here, Babylon was conquered by Persia. So now the people owning all of this are Persian. So it keeps moving into, but there's something strange with the kings of Persia. They have this heart for Israel. They have this heart for Judah. And 60 years before this is passed, so Nehemiah wasn't even born, in my opinion. I don't think he's that old here. The temple in Judah was rebuilt because the king sitting on the throne said this needs to be rebuilt. So 60 years prior, they go, these two men, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, Zerah, whoever, and his contemporary, they go and they rebuild. And 13 years from this past, from this, when this happens, Ezra goes out there to run the temple. Ezra is another one of those amazing, intelligent, understanding scripture and he's a he is a priest and he is a scribe so the fact that he can write he's a lawyer he understands just brilliant smart individuals so he's living in the territory there so it's been 60 years and here people come and they talk to nehemiah about what's going on in judah what's going on in that territory of land and the the it's just horrible because they keep trying to build this safe wall around the temple but everybody outside of the area keeps burning it down. They keep pulling it apart. They keep attacking and harassing the, the Israelites who live there. And whatever Nehemiah heard, it hit. It hit him. So imagine in your world when somebody comes and brings you some horrific news that pulls all hope out of your life. You were just hoping and you were excited for this thing to happen. And all of a sudden you get news that it's not going to happen because somebody who is evil, who doesn't want to see this great thing happen, has come and taken it away. So having this reaction to this, it says in Nehemiah 1 verse 4, we're going to be 
jumping into Nehemiah's prayer life because prayer is a tool. Prayer is a key. Prayer is a weapon. Prayer is a bridge. And here is how Nehemiah prepares himself to go stand on that line of the supernatural and to stand there. And it says in verse 4, he heard these words, and I believe his brother was one of the people coming back and reporting to him. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. He fasted and he prayed for days. <clears throat> and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. God, why is this going on? You, you moved the heart of this king to establish this. Who are these peons over there doing this? What is going on? And I said... O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenants and steadfast love or mercy with, whose, with those who love him and keep his commandments. There is this supernatural relationship between sin and repentance and reconnecting with the Lord and what happens in the supernatural when that connection stays. And his commandments and keeping them in obedience and loving God, it creates this supernatural barrier, quote unquote, if you will, a supernatural setting. And so then he goes on into verse six and says, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. Do you see what is going on? Of course he does, but you got to have conversation, right? That I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel. I realize we're in this predicament because of the stuff in our past that we already heard about, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. He's saying this to let God, he knows, I know you said this. But if you return to me, but remember this part, God, remember this, but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, if your lifestyle shows that you love me, though you're, you are outcast in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Nehemiah is re counting, rehearsing, restating, all of the stuff he learned. He is quoting scripture back to God as prayer. <laughs> they are your servants and your people. Those are the people you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. I'm here saying, I know you know this, you know I know this, and I'm talking to you because something needs to happen. And to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy, tender compassion in the sight of this man. We are watching Nehemiah pray because he has already decided to do something. Something has to happen. And oh man, is it me? Am I supposed to do this? Because Nehemiah is plotting and, and creating a system, a structure in his brain and realizing if he is not hearing from God, he could die. This sounds an awful lot like Esther's story. He wants to say something to the king, but in order to do that, you don't just request an appointment. He has to ask for you, you to ask for that. If he wants to, he could just kill you for asking. And then it ends and says, now I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah is in this interesting place of authority. The cupbearer to the king isn't his wine steward, although I'm assuming Nehemiah knew an awful lot about all the beverages, so he could recommend to the king what to have or what to do. But the main job of Nehemiah was whatever the king was going to drink. Nehemiah opened, put it in the cup, and poured that into his cup, and he drank some of it to see if he would die. Because if someone was trying to kill the king, Nehemiah would die first, and then the king would not drink that poison. So he had this process of overseeing all of that, making sure no poison got into the king through the liquids that he drank. And he had that type of trusted relationship, that he was an honorable man that the king would trust with that, that Nehemiah wasn't going to try to poison him. So I don't know how you work your way up the ladder to be cupbearer. Yeah, but there he was. So he had this unbelievable position of authority. He could be in the king's presence, not just in his presence, but right next to him. The king knew him, knew him well, and we know that by what we're going to read next. So here we paused as a group, as the Wednesday night crew, and here is an amazing example of prayer. So my question to everyone is, 
what kind of things did Nehemiah do here? I mean, what is going on? What, what kind of prayer is this? If you had to give this a title, what, what would you say? What kind of words are, are listed, action words are listed in this portion of Scripture? And not so we can memorize it, but so we can understand this is the kind of prayer this is. Have I ever done that? Do I ever pray Scripture? Do I ever quote Scripture back to God and remind him? Doesn't that seem disrespectful, Pastor Robin? <laughs> and I like God forgets his word. But here we have Nehemiah using scripture as a weapon, quote unquote, of prayer, and using it as a communication tool, and watching this back and forth happening. And there is no there is no answer. It's not like God said anything to him. It's not listed here. But Nehemiah, being a righteous man, realizing something has to be done, and I have access to the king, and I need to say something, there's something needs to happen, so I have to wonder what all is in Nehemiah's background. So if you had to give this a title, this is what was asked, and this is where everyone gets espresso next week, especially if we do a large <laughs> group Q&A, and we did a lot of Q&A last night. They're looking, and I know, I just love being his family. It's Wednesday night, we're right in the middle, and yes, we all had to deal with children who were really sugared up <laughs> over the weekend, which was great, and just there, and all right, okay, now you're making me think in a different way, Pastor O, what are, what are you looking for? Uh, it's not like I want answers, I want all of us to just kind of struggle a bit, and Okay, I'm reading somebody's prayer. Have I, ever, have I ever been motivated by something being ripped out that I thought was supposed to happen? And, and this is what I know God said, but it's not happening. And I'm not the only one who knows that God wants this to happen, but somebody comes and steals it right out from underneath you, and they, they make it this so it can't happen, and, and they try to interrupt it and call it back. I mean, there's just this doesn't make sense, God, because I've seen 60 years. It's been 60 years since you started this. And you don't start something, you're not going to finish. And so what's going on? I know Ezra's out there because Nehemiah and Ezra obviously knew each other and because they're both high up in structure. And so here there's this going on and asking the crowd, the crew last night, what is it like when that happens to you? This is the heartbeat. So how would, how would you entitle you praying in a situation like that? What kind of things were, were happening? And it's like, well... They brought up, and, you know, we had different people readily volunteer to write on the board. Mm -hmm. And here's Michelle's turn, and she's writing. People shouted out the words, um, they recognized God's power. Well, God, you're God of power and authority. So in my prayer, when I am preparing, when I'm making preparation to stand on the line of the supernatural, I can call on God's power. I can recognize his power. I can quote it right from Scripture. And it's powerful. It, it's a bridge, it's a weapon, it's a key, it's a tool. Um, what other things, Pastor Robert, do you remember that they, they brought up? They were defining this portion of scripture. Yeah, it talked about trust. Oh, yeah, your you trust. Know. Yep, I trust you, you're trustworthy. Yep. Exactly. Um, and uh, Nehemiah's earnestness, you know, he's yeah. being very earnest. Um, yes. And clear. <laughs> and, and mm, very specific. Very specific. This is your character. This is you. Yes. It looks a little bit like Nehemiah was verbally processing with the Lord. I love that. Yes. And that's, and, and that's for me, part of the, um, uh, the sweetness. I realize this is a horrible circumstance and what Nehemiah was going through. But what he does here, my goodness, we see this happen all the time in real life. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I love this. this. Yeah, this is one of my favorite ones. <laughs> and what other what other names c can we give this? What other names to our listening audience? What what names could you give this? What titles would you do? How how would you entitle this? Would you pull out words from here? Because he's reminding God who he is. Right. He's confessing sin. Mm -hmm. He's declaring and decreeing. That was one title. Declare and decree. Mm -hmm. And it was lovely seeing who had concepts in their brain just popping out yes yep and so i just love that and then confess and remind mm -hmm. uh, by the way sorry and remember what you promised <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's very much a child to an adult well and i wonder too just the um 
this really strikes me that Nehemiah is getting solid ground under his feet. Yes. You know, this is what I understand about reality. Not just what I see with my eyes, but I. this is what I know about God. This is what I know about his intention with people. This is what I know about the plan that you already put in motion that's being challenged or derailed. You know, um, God, you're doing something and it's it's being interrupted. Yes. And it's negatively impacting people. And we do this. And if you're looking at it and wondering, I've never prayed that way. I didn't know I could. You will be doing it because it's a very powerful relationship tool. Mm -hmm. But it does mean we need to read scripture so we can go back and, and state it. Go back and state it. I was going to say and hold God accountable, but that sounds horrible. I don't think I want to say that, so I take that back. But it kind of is. Well, it's like I can trust you exactly because you know it was fun in the discussion last night of as you were walking us through this, it popcorn into oh wait a minute he did this kind of thing here, he did that kind of oh huh yes. So if I had to entitle this, this would be my trust conversation. God, I know you. Mm-hmm. I know you. Mm-hmm. I trust you. Mm-hmm. Reminding you of this, but but I trust you. But I think the one that stuck and hit most people was the, the phrase intercessory prayer. Right. This is intercession mm-hmm. to the point where I, I can't eat and sleep. Mm-hmm. I, I am so undone. Mm-hmm. And here in Romans 8, 26 and 27, it is being written again. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God, I'm reading out of the New Living Testament, by the way. We don't know what God wants us to pray, to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all, he knows all our hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So... Nehemiah didn't know that was going to be written in the future. Nehemiah did not know that was going to be written in the future, but it was. It was penned, but it's the same process of what is here. I am praying, and he couldn't even pray, so he sat down and wept and mourned. He grieved, and allowing the Spirit to work around him back in the day. The Holy Spirit was around and on, but he wasn't in. So dealing with all of that, but realizing I am being asked, I'm standing, uh, my prayer is now a bridge for me to walk over because something else is going to be coming. So to the listening audience, what kind of title would you give this portion of Scripture here in Nehemiah 1, verse 4 through something, 11, there we go, (laughs) verse 4 through 11, and just look at his prayer and Find one of your own. Put a note in there. I pray like this in this situation. When hope was destroyed, but I know God promised that. And that was the process. So now we get to see it's about four months later. It didn't happen the next day. So we have about a four-month pause. And then we're reading in Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. We're going to read the prayer again, and then we're going to go back and dissect it, give it a title, and give it a, see if we've done this, and what is this like? So here, knowing Nehemiah's job, and knowing he's been having a hard time eating and sleeping, so I am saying that his physical appearance really looks different when the king sees him. I don't know when he was on working with the king as a cupbearer, if he was there. I don't think he was there daily. I'm assuming that there were other things going on. But no matter what, even if he was there daily, by now, this prayer session, this fasting, this weeping, this hungering for God's hand to move had reached an apex. And Nehemiah, in my opinion, his physical presence looks different, as we all know what it's like to fight and to go through hard for many, many weeks on end. Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Xerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, because if you were sad in his presence, it could be seen as being sick or something and contaminating, whatever. You could get fired from your job. You could get whatever. So being sad in his presence isn't just a, oh, it's a, you just didn't. 
trying to wrap her head around what was required. And the king said to me, why is your face sad seeing you are not sick? Because if you were sick, you were not going to be there. This is nothing but sadness of heart. This is nothing but sadness of the heart. I love this. Then I was very much afraid. Oh, everything I've been praying. Oh, okay. Everything I've been praying, asking, oh, God, here we go. And this is, oh, you know, I thought, oh, no. I thought God would go, oh, man. I thought my brother was going to come back and say, oh, no, no, that things had changed over, you know, in Jerusalem. And it's like, ah, oh, here, verse 3. And I said to the king, let the king live forever, honoring the king. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Ah, king being wise, ah, then what are you requesting of me? The king said. Nehemiah paused, allowed the king to drink his wine, which was poison free. <laughs> so I prayed to the God of heaven. He is in the middle of seeing prayers be answered, of walking on a prayer bridge, of watching and freaking out. <sighs> here we go, here we go, right in the middle of a spiritual battle, right in the middle of seeing something happen, and he is asking God to help him. Oh my God, you gotta help because I don't know what I'm doing and I don't wanna die. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. So. In this time of four months of fasting and praying and sitting in God's presence and reading scripture and knowing God's will, a, f a plan has formulated. Nehemiah has a spreadsheet, if you will. And so, poof, I believe this is what God wants. I'm in a position of standing in front of the person with all authority, and if he doesn't like it and he wants me dead, that's going to happen, but I am going to so, so much like Queen Esther. And the king said to me, with the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone, and when will you return? Everyone in the room heard Nehemiah exhale. Okay. So here the Holy Spirit had been working on the king, giving this understanding, giving him favor, however that works inside the king's heart. So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, goes on because he knows what it's going to take. Let letters be given to me and to the governors and the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he might give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for. For the good hand of my God was upon me. Well, how in the world did that good hand of my God come upon Nehemiah? comes up upon us by being obedient to what God asks us to do. Not everybody is asked to be cupbearer to the king. Not everybody is asked to do what Nehemiah is doing. But we are asked to do something. We are asked to walk in obedience. And in that walk of obedience, these things are open to all of us. So here is this, oh my God, he's moving, prayer. So what title would we give this one? It's related to the first one, but totally different stimuli. <laughs> Urgent. Yes. It was urgent. Oh, it was all oh, pee in my pants <laughs> urgent. We know now Nehemiah in this particular circumstance doesn't have a poker face, at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, yes, that can be, uh, yes. And I loved hearing the interaction of, of the titles given here. Yes, yep, yep. Yeah. Watching urgent, mm -hmm. bold. Yes. I was just like, yes, mm -hmm. in your face, enemy, because this mm -hmm. is where God has put me. And I want to be obedient instead of safe. Yeah. I want to be obedient instead of safe because I can trust my God. Yeah. Yep. And so obviously he was brave. Right, right. And this next one is one of my favorites, the intentionally unintentional. Yes. Huh. Yep. So you talked last night about him being prepared. He didn't know when he would need to be prepared. Yes. So he just prepared. Yes. So he was intentional. Yes. He put thought yes. behind it. He'd yes. been praying and he'd been fasting and an opening came up. And so it wasn't like, um, you know, if I'm recalling the conversation correctly, it wasn't like Nehemiah had this plan and he was forcing this plan through. Nehemiah, through prayer um, and wisdom and all that stuff, you know, came to some thoughts, but the Lord opened the door so he could be intentional in the moment that came. Yes. This being prepared and then just standing, right? Like, 
Paul is talking about this, being right. prepared, going to the spiritual line wherever you are and standing there. Right. W- are you standing in the gap for, for children, for adult, for the unsaved? Are you standing protecting? Are you standing in the gap for people caught up in addiction? Yeah. Are you sta- What are you doing? You're standing at this line, this spiritual line, yeah. and you are prepared yeah. and waiting for, well, you go here. Okay, there's a new line. And then God says, no, but I need you over here. Or you meet this person, you add them into your prayer life. Well, there's a new line to go stand. I mean, these amazing things that happen into our world. Mm-hmm. I'm not a cupbearer to the king. You're not a cupbearer to the king. We're not going to do Nehemiah. But the process that Nehemiah follows, we should be doing that all the time. It's part of this preparation and standing. Mm-hmm. So looking for a title for this, prayer of faith, um, being methodical, knowing that I have to be ready. So when he says, go, when the miracle happens, I'm ready to run. So being prepared, but not forcing it, knowing I can't make the king do squat. I have to be, when it happens, I will be bold. And it's so much easier to be bold in your declaration, but when it comes, notice, then I prayed. Oh, it comes. So my question to our listening audience is, have you had that experience where you know God is moving and you've prepared to this point, but there is what? You have to wait for God to open the next door. I'm hoping everyone who listens to this podcast has this experience of obedience in a relationship with God, which means you love him. I am sorry for my sins, Lord. They're in the way of our relationship. I don't want to be like King Manasseh and his sons. I want to be a repentant person who honors you, the person who created us, created me specifically, knit me together, as Psalm says, in my mother's womb. And I want that relate. So when you're in that relationship, this is all available to us. Scripture says this, so I'm going to love this. God, you don't want these people destroyed. You don't want this injustice to happen. Lord, you want these people to know you. Lord, you don't want these people stuck in materialism. I'm going to stand on this line if I would grow up in a materialistic family who loves stuff over people. You can stand there and declare that, be broken. I mean, all of these, that doesn't sound anywhere as important as what Nehemiah is doing. It's like, well, it is because you are praying for the future of your lineage, of your family line. So whatever he brings you to, whatever spiritual line, you're having this reaction like Nehemiah did. I can't take it anymore. I can't take it seeing my family harassed with this, or my family stuck in cycles of addiction, or my family, whatever it might be of of living without any idea for their eternal future. And I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to remind God of my family, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to prepare. So when the door opens, Hey, you know, a text, maybe an actual phone call, uh, something happened. I need you to call me. You're ready. There you go. This is the same type of process. So looking at the procedure and breaking it down into step by step, what is it that he did? Mm -hmm. And bold faith was one title. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I like the next one. Mm -hmm. The OMG pleading. Oh, my God, help, help, help. I love that one because for me, this is help now. Mm -hmm. The obedience, which leads us to a new place. Now, what are we going to do? Because you're the same God that got me here, so you're going to be the same God that gets me over. And I wonder, but that this was a prayer that Nehemiah was really familiar with Mm, and used mm, a lot. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because it strikes me as we're talking that as a cupbearer of the king, Nehemiah had to figure out a way. If you're going to remain sane, you've got to figure out a way to live and trust God, because we know he had a right. great relationship with, G- with uh, the Lord. He had to figure out a way to stay sane every day, because every moment of every day, his life was at risk. Yes. And somehow Good he point. had in his Good relationship point. with God to come to a place of peace with that. So I wonder, but that he was used to that kind of bold OMG pleading even internally. Correct. Good point. Yep. It's just fascinating to just sit and let this all bubble in Mm -hmm. your head. I would like to bring one more example, and then we will close this podcast. But this one just caught me by surprise, because I've read every year, I read through Nehemiah and enjoy, and am encouraged by him and a little bit intimidated by some of this. Like, wow, that was just a lot. Do I have that kind of faith? Do I live like that? And I I gear towards that. I I want to. And then just reading through all of the different chapters of Nehemiah, and I encourage, take your Bible, even 
hopefully you have one. If you have it digital, you can make notes in there. But make notes and, and name these prayers and give them definition. Like this is the help me prayer, and underneath that it's, it's an urgent, it's bold, it's scary, it's all of these things, but it happens when this goes, when God is answering something and asking me to step into something, and I'm really freaking out because I don't know what to do because I haven't been here before. So the, I haven't been here before faith, the stretching of my faith prayer, all right? So this is our last example here for this podcast. We're going to jump into Nehemiah 4, 7 through 9. And here he is now there. He is now on the property. He has been working at putting up the wall around the city so they can be safe, so people can't just come in and pillage and take. They have to get access to come through the gates. And believe it or not, Pastor Robin, the individuals who live around the area are not really happy that this is happening. And they keep sending messages back to Xerxes saying, oh, Nehemiah just wants to be king, and he's starting an army, and he's going to take, you know, you know this nation, these people shouldn't be allowed to be here, because all they want to do is worship their God, and they don't want to pay attention to all the gods of the territory, they just don't want to do it, and he wants to do this, and it is really interesting that God asked an individual who the king had to depend on for his life, and he would have to pause and say, yeah, I don't see Nehemiah doing that. But they kept doing it and kept doing it. So there's, it's interesting because on all four, four sides, north, south, east, and west, there were evil individuals trying to make sure this didn't happen. And as you read through Nehemiah, those individuals get names. One is from, is a Babylonian heritage. One is actually Jewish. One is from the uh, Ammonite territory. One is from. Uh, uh, the Arabs are from Egypt in that area. So, and strong individuals, one of them could have annihilated this whole area. So he gets stirred up. And, I mean, there's enemies on every side. Isn't it interesting that it's the people with the power that don't want things to change? Yes. Yeah, there you go. Good point. <laughs> it's not the it's not the you every know, day. destitute yes. everyday people yes. that are putting one foot in front of the other that are yeah. Anyway. So they are watching this and they are being made fun of and people come and watch them build and go, Oh, you're gonna make a wall out of these broken bricks? <laughs> Look at you. You're such an idiot. Your God is so great. He can't give you good building material. <laughs> Look at you. And day after day, every time. Oh, if, if a fox stands on that wall, it's going to crumble. That came from a fellow Israelite. So all of this happening over and over every day when they're out there. <laughs> In Nehemiah 4, 7 through 9. This one just caught me. But when Sanballat and, Tob and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, these are the people who have surrounded the Philistine cities. One is an Arabic city, one is this. So they're all around there. And they heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed. They were accomplishing exactly what they set out to do. They gave up. Ha <laughs> ha, no. They became so angry. They were seething. So have you ever had to deal with someone who was wickedly angry, who was evil in their intent, didn't want God's agenda to go forward, who wanted it to stop, who wanted what God was moving for themselves? You can't have that God that's mine, 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 mine. <laughs> and they plotted together. to come fight against Jerusalem and cause confusion. Have you ever had to deal with a situation? This does not make sense. This doesn't make sense. So this could be the, oh my God, this doesn't make sense. People are so weird prayer. Mm -hmm. So Pastor Robin, before I read the last verse here in verse 9, what kind of titles would you give this one? People are crazy. <laughs> I think of Diane's term of crazy right there. People are crazy and okay. Yeah, this is like the, uh, I don't know which end is up prayer. <laughs> you know, yes. as you're moving along, yes. it's like, you know, when you're dealing with people and they say that the sky is green and the grass is blue, it's yes. like, what? And then they get others to join them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. huh. Yes. <laughs> it's huh. so bizarre. It is. And watching the attack after attack. And at this point, they were building with a weapon in one hand 
and a tool in the other. So what did the people, when they seen this, it's like, wait a minute. The more we escalate, the more they get done, the more they're organized, the more they're inspired. I mean, they had to watch this, so the anger of this is our lab, we have to make, so you talk about opposition. Yeah where you just want to, I'm so tired of the, I'm so tired of you, the belligerence, I'm so yeah. tired of the selfishness, I'm so tired, whatever it is. So when you get to that point, this is what we do. This is the tool. This is the key. This is the weapon. This is the bridge. And so here is what Nehemiah did. And it's so fun because this stuff is just listed there. You, when you read Nehemiah, take a highlighter of a unique color that you don't use other, other places. And every time a prayer is, is ushered forward, highlight. So you can go back and say, is this related to a prior prayer or is this a new way to pray? How would I define this if I had a situation like this? Because if I did, prayer is the bridge, prayer is the weapon, prayer is the tool, prayer is the key. And in verse 9, we say, uh, he says, and we pray to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. So does that mean they pray to God and put up soldiers around them? Probably. But we pray to our God. We prayed and asked him to guard, to hedge, to protect. So earlier in this series, we talked about prayer as preparation. Here we're seeing this amazing example in Nehemiah. So I have to add this, this verse, Nehemiah 4.9, to our list of hedge of protection prayers. This phrase, hedge of protection, might be new to some of our listeners. But this idea of God supernaturally doing something that protects. And I believe this is what Nehemiah, once again, because he knew his history, and we know that he knew about Moses and that whole thing, because he quotes Moses to God. <laughs> so Hedge of Protection Prayers is brought up in Job 1, 9 through 10, Psalm 34, 7, all of Psalm 91, Hosea 2, 5 through 7, and Deuteronomy 23, 14, and now Nehemiah 4, 7 through 9, this idea of a hedge of a protection. In, in my opinion, my imagination, Nehemiah is seeing the pillar of cloud in front of him and the pillar of fire behind him. Day and night. The day and night phrase is not there by happenstance. He is seeing Moses and the nation of Israel and Egypt coming after them and wanting them to not go and do what God wanted, not to settle this land, not to be obedient to God. And here they say, and they're just, they say yes to them and then they come back and get them. It doesn't matter. They are crazy in their own sin. Here they get to see these, these people who were making money and going to lose an power and income if this happens. Those who were selfish and hardened of heart, they are crazy. They're getting into this crazy upset to the point where they are not just breaking down, but they are trying to harm the people building. And if I have my history remembering correctly, they had people move into the city to st stay safe so they couldn't hurt their families that were outside of the wall. And so they're just organizing and creating this confusion and mess. When you walk in the, how can this happen? How in the world do, this doesn't make any sense. And the older you get, the more opportunity you have for those situations. This is when you pray a hedge of protection. This is when you pray to God to set a guard in front of you and behind you. So as we close today, here is my closing question. How do I pray? Can I identify a multitude of prayer labels or, or titles? Do I know what it is like to ask for God's protection? When I am in a hard, intense situation, is the very first thing I do pray? My encouragement, have I discovered prayer as a tool? Do I know prayer as a weapon? Do I know prayer as a bridge? Do I know prayer as a key? Go jump in the book of Nehemiah and find out. Thank you for joining us on this week's discussion on Still Standing, Week 8, The Example of Nehemiah. 
Please join us and the whole Wednesday night crew at Maranatha's Forest Lake Campus at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday evenings, and you'll get a chance to enjoy this discussion live. Oh, bring espresso. Um, <laughs> don't forget, <laughs> you can check out our website, www.realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night for all of Pastor Orlean's notes and references, and feel free to share it with your friends. And today, wherever we find ourselves, let's love God and love people. See you for the next Chew on this episode.